Hello, I'm Andrew Young, and I've been around here since 1960. And in all of these years, I've been involved at almost every level of this community, uh, trying to figure out a way to bring people together. Uh, Atlanta started out as a city too busy to hate, and we became an international city and an Olympic city, and and yet we still have always had certain socioeconomic divisions that uh, we have been challenged. Now, I can't stop here though, because we have been inflicted by a virus that has pulled the core out of the economy of our city. And what we have come to learn is that not only do black lives matter, uh, but that we cannot survive in a city without essential workers being included and free to contribute. That challenge is both educational and social, uh, but it's mainly economic. We're almost challenged to start over, but the spirit of unity, the spirit of responsibility, uh, the concern for each other as brothers and sisters, and with particular concern for the least of these God's children, has been what the beloved community is about. One of the joys of being a part of the Atlanta community is that we have not only important and powerful men, we are blessed with some beautiful and intelligent and phenomenal women. And we have two of them with us this afternoon or this morning or whenever you're looking at this. And that's our mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who has really done yeoman's work in seeing us through these crises. And she's not only been doing it at the, national, at the local level, but she's made us proud every time we see her at the national level. But I'm sure glad she was not asked to be vice president. <laughs> Dan Cooper is also someone who has made it in the business world. I have watched Shan Cooper grow through Lockheed, Rock 10, uh, and now she's with us again as the executive director of the Atlanta Committee for Progress. And we're grateful to have her. Welcome, welcome to the Beloved Conversation Series. I'm Shan Cooper, and I'm joined today by a true daughter of the city of Atlanta, the 2020 Georgian of the Year and the 60th mayor for the city of Atlanta, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Good afternoon, Mayor. Hi, Shan, it's great to see you virtually. It's good to see you as well. Looks like you're in an exciting place. Well, my kids are spread out all over the house with virtual learning, so I have four kids, so it's a lot going on inside, so I just decided to switch it up today. Well, it's beautiful and wish, and wish I were there with you. Well, Mayor, I, I guess I'm excited this afternoon just to have a candid conversation with you around the topics of race and economic mobil mobility and the building of Dr. King's beloved community. And this is a candid conversation. You and I talk all the time, so it'll be like you and I just talking on the phone. But I, um, I want to start though with talking about you and, and leadership and the moment that we're in today. Uh, as you know, our country is having a reckoning with race and racism, and you've had powerful, heart well, heartfelt, uh, what many have termed mama moments um, when you speak about this to the public as a mom as a black woman, as a mayor. And my question today to you is, um, has, it been, has it been hard to successfully be all three in the moment, in the climate that we're living in today? It is difficult, but Chan, first and foremost, and you know this because you're a mom, that never goes away. And it's always top of mind and really is a, a guide, guiding uh, point for me 
with everything that I do. I can't help but see things through the lens of my kids. Even as I, I mentioned, they're all spread out um, with virtual learning today. So I decided to step outside so I wouldn't interview with what I, I wouldn't interfere with what they had going on during this interview. But particularly as it relates to what's been happening across our country over the past several months, um, three of my kids are African American young men, um, and I have one daughter. And I, I see it from all angles. I see the emotion, the personal impact that it's having on my kids. And it ranges from sheer anger uh, to complete fear. And I see the confusion and, and I see, um, obviously through my lens as mayor, the responsibility and often lack thereof um, that's led us to this point in time. And so, it's uh it's an interesting time to to be a mother and a mayor to say the least do you ever feel conflicted in any way i do i do and even on um, may 29th when um, things erupted in our city i was able to get my son to come downtown with me to police headquarters uh, he wanted to go out and be in the streets and i said well why don't you come and see it from this vantage point and, and to the extent that I have any conflict, it is, uh, you know, this conflict between this professional side of me that quite often has to be neutral and has to take a step back and see it from all angles, um, as opposed to if I were just in my mother mode, I could just be and feel and, and be on whatever side I, I need it to be on um, for the sake of my kids. But it, it, this is a little different. It calls on me to balance in ways um, that I might, a lot of other people may not have to balance. They can just have their opinions and, and it rests at that. But my opinions also have to balance with whatever actions and responsibilities I have as mayor. Absolutely. And to your point, Mayor, you're always a mom, right? Always. That doesn't go away. What has this moment taught you about your leadership style? To follow my instincts and that there's often no blueprint. And quite often, um, and I just remember early on as mayor, quite often I would go, well, you know, what, what do other mayors do? What have other mayors done? And and, and how would they think about this? And how would they, uh, how would they approach this? But there are these moments where you don't even have the luxury of time uh, to even get input from other folk. You just have to go with what you know. And this has been this moment in time, specifically um, the, the night uh, that Atlanta erupted into violence. There, there was no time to think and second guess and, and triple think. I just had to go with what I felt in my gut and that's what people saw. Well, I tell you, people saw it, Mayor, and, I, and it inspired us all, I'll say that. And I will remember uh, a few of your words when you talked about, and this is where I saw the mother side come out, when you said to us, go home because I can't protect you. And then you talked with us about um, that we couldn't out care you about what was happening in the moment. And there, all of us, I think across the nation, we saw real, true leadership. And we were just inspired by that. You should just know that. But those words uh, continue with us today. So thank you for that, Kim. I appreciate that. Well, let's talk about Atlanta. Um, Atlanta has long been known as the city too busy to hate. And some would say that Atlanta influences everything. And my question to you today is, how do you believe that Atlanta is uniquely positioned to meet this moment? Can we and should we serve as a role model to other cities? And if so, how do you think we can best do that? Atlanta is so far ahead of other cities just in terms of the consciousness um, that we have as it relates to civil and human rights in this city. Uh, but it, it's a double-edged sword. There is this legacy of consciousness in this city and action and leadership. But I do believe in so many ways it often makes us a bit complacent. Uh, because we think that everything's okay in Atlanta and these things don't happen in Atlanta because we've been doing this for decades. We've got it right. But, but clearly, uh, we are as vulnerable uh, during this moment in time as anyone and we can't be complacent. But 
Um, because of what Ambassador Young calls his social contract in Atlanta, we have a head start in so many ways. So even as I sit here speaking with you um, as the executive director with ACP, when we have challenges in this city, there's so many mayors across this country who don't have the support of the business community and don't have the opportunity to go to the philanthropic community and, and don't have a brain trust like we have in this city and don't have people who care about really working to create this beloved community. So they're starting at zero. Uh, whereas in Atlanta with so many challenges we have, we get to start at five um, and then we get to move to 10. So that's, that's it, it, we're fortunate in that regard, but it also gives us an opportunity to create a blueprint that other cities who don't have the resources and the man and woman power that we have in this city, that they can lift our blueprint and they can replicate it in their cities and people trust it because it's Atlanta. You're absolutely right, Mayor. I would agree 100%. We are unique. You know, Atlanta is a unique city. I've lived other places and this is, this is home. Not born here, but this is home. So building this beloved community that we know Dr. King talks a lot about, um, other leaders in our community talk a lot about it. Um, so in today's surreal climate, you know, we've got a global pandemic, uh, hyper-partisanship, racial injustice, economic turbulence. Um, how do we even begin to build a beloved community in this environment today? I think everything begins with will, sheer willpower to build this beloved community. Now, what we know is that faith without works is dead. So once you believe that we can achieve this, then we have to do the work. We have to come together to do the work and we have to be open to different perspectives and we have to give one another grace. So if as African-Americans, we're asking people to recognize who we are and we're saying Black Lives Matter and we want you to articulate and acknowledge that in what you do in your respective areas, we then have to give you the grace to be able to grow into that space and to express those things which people are ignorant about or those things that they simply don't understand because this really is a movement. It's not just a moment in time. Um, but I, I know we can get there. Dr. King and, and so many others laid out this blueprint for us for this beloved community. So now we have to put the work into the words that have been left for us um, and just make sure that we live up to the legacy that Atlanta represents to the world. And Mary, you have, a, you have an outstanding vision out there that you refer to as One Atlanta. And when I think about One Atlanta, to be honest with you, I also think about that beloved community. And um, say just a few words about One Atlanta and why, why you chose that, that vision. One Atlanta is all about achieving this equitable place where our residents and our businesses are equipped to succeed. Everybody doesn't have every tool that they need in their toolkit to succeed, but it really is our goal as a city to make sure that we help stand in the gap to give people the resources that they need and the access to information that they need to achieve uh, this one Atlanta, this beloved community. It really is a continuation of that beloved community. Atlanta in so many ways is a tale of two cities. And it is um, something that's plagued us for many, many decades. It's plagued us throughout many administrations, mayoral administrations. Um, and when you look at our, the inequality gap in Atlanta, we rank amongst the worst in the nation. And in a city like Atlanta, with all of the resources that we have and all of the sheer will that we have, it's, it is unacceptable. And One Atlanta really is about filling in that gap and making sure that whether you live on Bankhead or whether you live in Buckhead, uh, that you have access uh, to resources to make sure that you're able to succeed. So Mayor, let's talk about economic mobility and well-being, particularly for the Black community. The pandemic did not create extreme wealth or health gaps. It revealed them and in many cases made them worse. We know the statistics that 50% of black owned businesses may permanently close during this pandemic, or that COVID very directly affects the health of black communities disproportionately. Given this, 
Should our response be different for black communities compared to others? Why or why not? And what are we still not getting right? I think our response certainly has to be different because we have to meet businesses and people at their point of need. And what we saw at the beginning of COVID when we set up our uh, program through Invest Atlanta to offer grants and funding support for many businesses. One, we saw that many black businesses weren't eligible for the PPP funds that were being distributed because they didn't have the long-term existing relationships with banks in the way that many other businesses do. Many African-American businesses don't have employees. If you think about beauty shops and, and barber shops in our community, my mom owned one for almost 25 years. My mother didn't have employees. She had independent contractors who paid her booth rent. Um, under those circumstances, it would have been more challenging for her to access money through the CARES Act. So what we did in Atlanta was really try to anticipate the needs of small businesses and set up funds that could support businesses that we knew might fall through the cracks. So we set up um, a, a Strength and Beauty Fund. The Strength and Beauty Fund is for barbers and cosmetologists. We set up the CREATL Fund, which is for those who work in, in the gig economy and in, in the creative industry. We set up small business loan funds so that we could give grants to small businesses. And uh, because we have over 50%, I believe, of businesses, minority-owned businesses in a metropolitan area, we knew that it would be important to really anticipate what we knew some of the shortcomings would be in terms of accessing funding. And I, I truly believe that has to continue, that we have to provide resources and support to our businesses so that when the worst happens, um, that they are equipped to survive and to be able to access the same lifelines that so many other businesses have been able to access to help, help them weather the storm. Absolutely. And I know that, um, Mayor, under your leadership, ATL Strong was birthed. And uh, to your point, it's a way that we can all contribute uh, via United Way, as a matter of fact, to support the communities that you just talked about and, and, and communities that really need our help at this point, really need our help. And then uh, again, going back to this Atlanta way with ATL Strong, we've had so many businesses and individuals in our city give directly to that fund uh, to help us shore it up. We created uh, the ATL Strong uh, support line, uh, atlstrong.org, before we even got CARES Act funding from the federal government. So it was already in place and we had people writing six-figure checks to help make sure that the folk in Atlanta have what they needed. And that doesn't happen in a lot, a lot of other cities across America. Absolutely. One other area, Mary, that I know you've been paying a lot of attention to, uh, that is emergency rental assistance, uh, our housing position right now. I know there is an eviction moratorium that will be lifted at some point, but any thoughts on the emergency rental assistance, just housing in general you'd like to share? Well, again, anticipating needs. So we made sure that we had something in place, one through an executive order that I signed to suspend evictions uh, for people who are connected through the Atlanta Housing Authority, Invest Atlanta, the Beltline, et cetera. So that was already in place. And then calling upon our courts to halt evictions, but to the extent that private land, um, um, that private landowners are continuing with evictions, then we have the rental assistance program. But there's still some who are taking advantage of the pandemic and the vulnerability of folk and forcing them to move out. So we're now uh, working with a number of people to make sure that they have secure housing, uh, secure housing where people will respect, have respect and regard for them when they may be at their weakest point, which so many people in our city are right now. Uh, those are the type of, types of people we want people in Atlanta to have relationships with. And thankfully, we've had so many people step up. I'll turn to a different topic. Um, we've lost several of our heroes uh, this year. Dr. Lowry, Dr. C.T. Vivian, and most recently, Congressman John Lewis. And I know that you all were very close. And so in your opinion, um, Congressman Lewis always talked about good trouble. 
in good trouble. <laughs> we should all get into good trouble. <laughs> so what kind of good trouble do you want to see more Atlantans or even more Americans uh, get into? I, I'm so inspired seeing people mobilize and seeing people working and demanding change. But the good trouble I want to see is, is not just the protest. I, I want to see the problem solving too. Um, when you think about the civil rights movement and you think about Congressman Lewis and those who worked in the civil rights movement, it was not just about organizing to march. It was organizing to march and then saying, these are the things we want and this is how you can achieve it. And it was about peaceful, nonviolent social change. That is the good trouble that Congressman Lewis wrote about in his parting essay to us. Uh, it, it's the good trouble that continues. And again, the blueprint has been left for us. Um, when we see what's happening across the country with violence erupting, it's not accomplishing anything. Real change happened in this country when people were thoughtfully organized and when they did it in a peaceful, nonviolent way. That's the good trouble I want to see continue in our city. Wonderful. Well, I certainly appreciate your encouraging um, want all of us to take the first step by voting, uh, by being involved in our community, supporting our communities. And uh, for that, Mayor, you're clearly a role model for all of us for that. So Mayor, I'll, I'll ask one, one other personal question. And uh, we often see you on the national stage and just always throughout the city and uh, always with a smile and, and confident and you appear to be very happy and excited about life. Um, what, what, <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you going? What, what is the juice that keeps our mayor going? What <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, faith has everything to do with it and faith and family because my, my kids take their cues from me. And um, I, I have one in particular, my, my youngest son is the most emotionally sensitive child that I think anybody can ask for, even when I don't know that I look worried. He looks at me and he says, is everything okay? You look very worried. So, um, you know, so much of it is, is hope, hopefully I'm raising my kids to be optimistic and to be resilient and to know that life is not going to always be easy, um, but the grace of God is sufficient. And Sometimes you get knocked down, but it's not about how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up. So it's, it's faith and family, just trying to be a good example for my kids. And, 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 and hopefully um, the, the city is a bit encouraged by it too. I just want to thank you uh, for your time today. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the vision of One Atlanta. And thank you for the heart that you feel for all of us, all the citizens of, of, of the city. And uh, we just wish you uh, all the best. And know well, that you have, a, you have a team of people standing behind you. <laughs> well, thank you, Shan. I mean, and, and, you know, it takes a village. And my village includes so many people across this city. But a very important part of that village is um, leaders like you who make my job so much easier. All I have to do is wish it and speak it. And then there are angels in our midst like you who magically come together. And, and make it happen. So I appreciate it. It's an honor to be the mayor of the city. It's an honor to be a part of this, this team that's helping to lead us, lead the world um, in, in good trouble. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. As two Nobel Peace Prize winners produced in this city, uh, President Jimmy Carter and Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, so we are a city of peace and a city of freedom. And you have helped us to realize that that's not easy, that it's a constant struggle. We say all the time that freedom is a constant struggle. We struggle so long that we must be free. And that's true, but with freedom comes additional challenges and meeting those challenges peacefully has been one of the blessings that we pray for in our city. And the leadership of women like you means that uh, 
we're going to keep on keeping up, climbing a little higher, a little higher, and a little higher. Let me encourage you to watch this conversation and all of the others at BelovedBenefit.org. Thank you.